Hey everyone, welcome to the author reading for Rune Mart with me and PD Mac. Uh, we're going to be reading book two of the Dragons of Isenthal series. So we're doing the same format as book one. We'll each be reading one chapter and we'll do weekly videos. So uh, this week we are starting with chapter one and two. So with that said, uh, we'll just jump into it. Chapter one, Gwen. Gwen could smell rain in the air. Her mount's ears perked up as thunder rumbled ominously overhead, but otherwise the animal continued trudging along the road undeterred. Emil rode next to Gwen, her attention focused ahead. Should we try to find shelter? Gwen asked. Emil shrugged. A little rain never hurt anyone. Gwen decided that was a fair point, but she didn't find the idea of getting soaked very appealing. Since she had no idea how to get to their destination, she was left with no other choice but to continue following Emil. The rain started as a gentle sprinkle and quickly turned into a downpour. The road was worn from wagon traffic, and the indents left with, from the wheels quickly filled with water, tinted brown from the dirt. Between the storms and the complete lack of civilization, Gwen was glad to have Emil's company over the last few days. The woman had her quiet moments, but she never shied away from conversation. Anytime Gwen started to think about her father or Tobias, she would divert her mind by asking Emil a random question. If Emil had grown tired of her, she did well to hide it. They rode through the storm, and the sun eventually returned, making the air feel thick and humid. Gwen's wet clothes stuck to her skin, irritating her and making her mutter foul curses under her breath. The two traveled half a mile after the last of the rain fell before Gwen spotted a town ahead. A poorly made sign displayed the town's name, Woodpine. Have you been here before? Gwen asked. I usually pass through without stopping. There's not much to see. Gwen frowned in disappointment. Emil hadn't set a breakneck pace by any means, but it was steady with few stops. Unless she had to relieve herself, Emil barely left the saddle. As the, as the road led them into the heart of Woodpine, Gwen found the place similar to Dawsbury. They even had an inn, which made Gwen question what Emil meant when she said there wasn't much to see. There was always something interesting to see at an inn. Emil continued through the town without stopping, and as they were about to cross over a small bridge, a group of armed men stepped into the road in front of them. They wore piecemeal armor, and their weapons were more rust than metal. Halt, one of the men shouted, pointing a spear at Emil's horse. Gwen pulled on the reins, forcing her mount to stop. Emil continued ahead until the spear tip was inches from her horse before she directed the animal to stop. The man with the spear seemed uncertain and glanced around at his fellows. What's the issue? Emil asked. You've got to pay the toll, the man said. Yeah, pay the toll, another chimed in. Are you in service to the king of Steep Cross? Bah! The king's a fool, Spearman replied. He's off in the castle, ignoring all the problems around here. So you know what we said? We said, we're going to make our own laws. And one of those laws is you have to pay a toll across this bridge. And if I don't want to pay the toll, Amal asked calmly, then we'll take it from you by force, one of the other men threatened. Move out of my way, Amal said. The group of brigands, brigands exchanged looks and whispers with each other, and Gwen assumed they must not have received a reaction like Amal's before. They seemed confused about how to handle Emil. Finally, the spearman poked the horse and said, pay first, then we'll move. Emil looked at Gwen, then back at the brigands. Gwen saw the look in Emil's eyes and guessed trouble was going to ensue. She was about to turn her horse around when Emil lifted her arm and said, tying. Flame erupted from her hand, catching the spear on fire and causing the group of men to stagger back from the heat. The apparent leader dropped the spear and threw his hands up in, the, in defeat. I don't like repeating myself, Emil said. No need to, the man said hurriedly. Let's go, boys. Clear the way. The brigands dispersed from the road, and Emil flicked to reins. Her mount continued along the road, and Gwen urged her horse to follow. As they crossed the bridge, Gwen thought she could hear someone crying out for help. There was a shack on the left, old and dilapidated. She guessed the sound was coming from there. Do you hear that? Gwen asked. It's probably a trap, Emil replied. Maybe, but what if it's not? Emil stopped her horse and turned her gaze on Gwen. If it is, are you prepared to have the blood of these fools on your hands? 
We can easily leave right now, but if it's a trap and we have to fight our way out, these men will die. Swords and spears cannot overpower magic. <laughs> Gwen hesitated. The cry for help sounded genuine. She couldn't leave knowing someone might need help, but the thought of killing the brigands didn't sit well with her either. I think we should check it out. Suit yourself, Hamel said. She dismounted and headed for the shack. Gwen slid out of the saddle and jogged to catch up. The brigands watched them until Emil opened the door of the shack. The leader stalked toward them. Stop, he shouted. Don't go in there. Emil ignored him and stepped inside. Gwen peeked through the doorway curiously, but she kept her focus on the men around, around them. Gwen lifted her arm, facing her palm at the approaching leader. He stopped in his tracks, but his expression revealed his anger. Emil stepped out a moment later, followed by a young elf. Despite his disheveled look and dirty clothes, Gwen thought there was something regal about the elf. His blonde hair was matted, and a smear of blood ran the length of his forehead. Twin pools of emerald green stared at Gwen, and she averted her gaze, somehow feeling inferior. That's our elf, the brigand leader said. Says who? Emil questioned. Says me. We captured him fair and square. You aren't stealing our reward. Reward? Gwen asked. What do you mean? That elf is the Prince of Olivelle. He ran off, and his father is offering a reward to anyone who returns him. Me and my boys are going to do just that. No, I don't think so, Emil said. He's coming with us. Are you deaf, woman? I just said you aren't stealing our reward. How much is the Elven King offering? A thousand gold astrals. How about a wave of flames and death instead, Emil asked. The leader of bravado disappeared and he spat on the ground. Blasted mage, he grunted. He'll ride with me, Emil told Gwen. Then she walked back to where they'd left the horses. The brigands eyed them with hatred, but none of them were brave enough to risk testing Emil's promise of death. Gwen mounted her horse and waited for Emil to take the lead. She continuously looked over her shoulder to make sure <clears> the men weren't doing anything. Emil's horse began trotting along, and Gwen urged her mount into motion. They put a decent distance between them and the woodpine, then Emil guided her horse to the left, off the road. They rode into a thicket of trees, and Emil dismounted, tying her reins to a tree branch. What are you doing? Gwen asked. It's still daylight. I want to make sure these fools don't do anything stupid, Emil replied. The last thing we need is to be surprised in the middle of the night. Good point, Gwen said, dismounting and tying her horse next to Emil's. The elf they'd rescued was subdued. He sat down on the ground among the trees. His eyes moved back and forth from Gwen to Emil. Let me guess, he said. You're going to take me back to my father and take his money. Possibly, Emil replied. Then again, maybe not. What are you doing out here anyway? I left my father's court willingly, he answered. His closed view of the world around us is suffocating at best. I've heard the gossip among my father's servants. King Torian is threatening our peaceful way of life. My father doesn't believe Torian is a menace, so he's ignoring the rebellion's pleas for help. I refuse to stand with my father on this. So you ran off to a human kingdom? Emil asked. You do know Olivelle and Steepcross aren't exactly on friendly terms, right? I know that, the elf said. <clears throat> I'm not a fool. I was on my way to Eisenthal to find the rebellion when those humans attacked me. Attacked me! Within Olivelle's borders, no less. How they managed to get past our patrols is a mystery that's been plaguing me for days. Well, it seems you were in luck, Gwen said. Emil and I are part of the rebellion against King Torian. Truly? Oh, thank goodness. I was afraid I'd traded one captor for another. What's your name? Gwen asked. Kirith of House Yulden. Well, Kirith, it seems your friends aren't quite ready to give up on that reward, Emil said. Stay low. Gwen hid behind a large tree and peered around the edge. The brigands they'd left behind were coming up the road swiftly, all of them riding horses. Gwen guessed they had stolen them from the people of Woodpine. The leader slowed his mount and whistled, pointing toward the thicket where Gwen and her companions were hiding. The tracks go that way, he said. Gwen watched the men dismount and draw their weapons. She looked at Emil. The woman had turned her attention behind them. She tilted her head to the side, listening to something Gwen couldn't hear. What is it? Gwen whispered harshly. Emil held up her finger, a sign for Gwen to be quiet. Kira's head jerked to the side and his eyes widened. Sentinels are coming, he warned. Emil cursed and beckoned Gwen to come closer. The two women rushed to where Kira was, and Emil closed her eyes. A moment later, one of the runes on her right arm began to glow with a sickly green light. Don't move, Emil said softly. I can hide us visibly, but noise can still be heard. Gwen stood completely still. She didn't realize she was holding her breath until she started to hear her heart beating in her ears. Kira slowly lifted a hand and pointed. 
Gwen looked and didn't see anything at first, but then she saw movement. It was almost imperceptible. A tall elf, wearing leather armor that mirrored his surroundings, slipped through the thicket without a sound. He carried a bow in one hand and a quiver of arrows across his back. The elf stopped when he spotted the brigands and raised his bow, slipping an arrow onto the string. He took aim and paused. Gwen wondered what he was waiting on, but then she spotted more movement. Three more elves, similarly dressed as the first, moved into position and readied their arrows. At, at an unspoken command, the elves let their arrows fly at the same time. Each arrow struck a target, taking down half the group of brigands. The leader shouted a retreat, but the elven sentinel fired off another round of projectiles to finish the job. Gwen swallowed hard and hoped the elves wouldn't, would disappear as quickly as they appeared. Kirith returned his I, Kirith closed his eyes and lowered his head into his hands. The elves investigated the bodies of the brigands and then left in the direction they'd come. Gwen looked at Emil. The woman had her eyes open now, and she watched the trees intently. Are they gone? Gwen whispered. An arrow whizzed past her face, so close she felt the wind stir against her lips. She jerked her head back, belatedly in surprise, and noticed an elf standing behind Emil. She pointed wordlessly, her eyes widened in terror. The elf pressed the tip of a sword to Emil's back. Tell me why I shouldn't end your life, the elf demanded. Chapter 2, Coggle. One hand on top of the other, <clears throat> resting on the pommel of his saddle, Connell sat astride his steed at the crest of the road, staring at the city of Hamlin in the near distance, remembering the last time he was here. Are you sure we have to go in there? We need a place to rest, Bjork reminded him. Besides, you're a different person than the last time you were here. He flicked his reins, urging his mount forward. Connell ticked his head to the city. Tell that to them. I'm hungry, Torvis said, squeezing the flanks of his stout pony. Why'd we come this way when we're supposed to be heading up to Denhelm, Connell complained, catching up to ride beside the dwarf. Like I've already said several times, Briak answered with a hint of frustration. We need to meet with someone here. He scanned the road and surrounding farmland. All seemed normal with the usual traffic heading in and out of the city gates. Who is this guy again? Connell asked. He's a friend. He's the one who told me about you. Connell raised an eyebrow in doubt. If you knew about me, why don't you come get me before I got branded? Briak paused and said, because there were other matters that demanded my attention. Yeah, like what? Briak cast a glance at Torgrith, like two dwarves that needed immediate rescuing. Your brother scared the piss out of us, Torgrith chuckled. Hmm, Jerusalem can be intense at times. You think? Connell snorted a laugh, merging into the ebb and flow of travelers, farmers, clerics, and merchants. Connell was surprised when the two guards at the gate paid them scant attention. Something's not right, he quietly commented as they passed through the gatehouse. They didn't even make eye contact. Maybe they're bored, Parker offered. They weren't bored the last time I was here, Connell countered. It wasn't until they were halfway up the main street towards the market square that he blurted, they're not real guards. What? Briak and Torgrith replied in unison. They're not real guards, Connell repeated, spinning around. Look at the uniforms. They're wearing the red jackets, but where's the rest of the uniform? The boots, the helmet. Briak paused to cast a concerned glance over his shoulder. We need to find my friend. Find out what's going on. Follow me. Briak set a brisk pace, taking streets and alleyways around the market square to the stables. Once their mounts were settled, he led him deeper into the back alleys of the city. At one corner of one alleyway, Connell grabbed his two companions' arms and dragged them into the shadows. What? Torgoth began before Connell jabbed a finger to his lips and pointed across the street to a man pretending to be nonchalant, leaning against the wall by a residence door as he studied the passersby. That's Justin. Oscott has to be close by. Connell's sudden desire for revenge bubbled up as he silently deliberated how. Leave him, Briak urged. We'll deal with him later. We need to find my friend. I'm not going until I see what he's up to. We don't have time for this, Briak fussed. We'll come back for him. Ignoring him, Connor lifted a foot to step out when the door opened and Oscon emerged, blinking in the sunlight. There you are, Connell snarled. He's halfway across the street before anyone realized. 
Justin was the first to see him. Well, look who's back, he mocked, until he saw the grim determination in Connell's eyes. Immediately interspersing himself between his boss and the approaching former highwayman, he placed a hand on the handle of his dagger by his side, a warning that he would not hesitate to use it. Remembering the young man's past with the highwayman, he was neither intimidated nor worried that he could handle this young pup. Hold it right there, Justin ordered a hand pressed forward. Connell stared past Justin to see the smirk plastered on Oscon's face, a smirk that said he would repeat Connell's humiliation if necessary. Oscon's arrogance grew when Justin slipped the blade out and pointed it at Connell. His smirk abruptly vanished when Connell smacked the blade out of Justin's hand, then delivered such a blow to the man's chest that it cracked several ribs and sent him flying backwards to crash against the stone walls of the building, only to crumple into a heap on the street. What followed next happened so fast that Oscon wasn't quite sure how he ended up with Connell's hand wrapped around his throat, his body lifted inches off the ground. What he did know was the vice grip squeezing his throat hurt and he couldn't breathe. In desperation, he grabbed the dagger in his boot and swung up to stab Connell in the gut, only to have his thrust stopped short. Connell's grip so tight that he felt his hand grow numb, the blade slipping from his fingers to rattle to the ground. You set me up, Connell growled, his anger adding power to his strength. You condemn me to be a slave. He felt a calm hand touch his arm and heard Briox say, let's not kill him quite yet. We need information from him. Come on, Connell, Torbreth urged when Connell hesitated. You can kill him later. I'll even help if you want. We can cut off his fingers and then his toes, peel his eyelids off and even cut off his tongue. Startled at the gruesome details, Connell twisted his head to gaze at the dwarf who returned his loop look with a loopy grin. You are one strange dwarf, he chuckled, shaking his head. Mama said the same thing about me. Torgat's grin widened. Connell relaxed his grip and Oscon sucked in a deep breath. Rex stared down at Oscon. You're coming with us. You make one false move and you're a dead man. What about him? Torgoth hooked a thumb at Jessen, who hadn't moved, his hands clutching his ribs. Leave him, Brock answered. Doubt he'll be going very far anytime soon. Torgoth bent down and picked up Oscon's dagger, twisting it around in his hands. Nice dagger. Where'd you get it? Oscon shifted a wary glance at him, his hand rubbing his throat. Bought it a while ago. Really? Torgoth shot him, you're a liar, look. He held up the dagger so that his two friends could see. This dagger is made from dwarven iron. The smith's mark is here. He pointed to his symbol beneath the quillion. Note the crown and the mark. The maker was a kingsmithy. He turned to give Oscon a hard stare. There hasn't been a kingsmithy in any dwarven land for over 150 years. How do you know that? Connell asked, impressed. Because the last, last kingsmithy was Gunnar Ironhammer. He was my grandfather. Narrowing his stare at the man, his lip curled in anger. I'll ask you once more. Where did you get this? Oscon looked down upon the dwarf, shrugged in faint ignorance. Torga turned to Briok. Can I kill him? Not yet, Briok answered with a curious frown. What more can you tell us of the blade? It was most likely a gift from my grandfather to the king in Isenthal. Cameron? Connell blurted. No, my young friend, Torga answered with an indulgent smile. It would have been King Sered, Cameron's great-great-grandfather. He turned back to Briok. This is a king's gift, which means that also probably Elvin imbued. He twisted his head to give Oscon a look of disdain. And this fool probably didn't even know it. Elvin imbued? Connell marveled before the curtain pulled back from the nearby window, diverted his focus, and he suddenly noticed passersby slowing the stride of Gok, or beginning to draw attention. Torbreth jabbed the dagger point at Oscon's side. Start walking. Pray that I don't accidentally stumble and stick this all the way in. Oscon's arrogance returned as he moved away from the door and into the street. Catching Justin's eye, he ticked his head in a quick nod, receiving a nod of understanding in return. You fools. You don't know who you're messing with. When word gets out what you've done, your lives won't be worth a copper royal. Connell noted the exchange between the two outlaws and Kami walked over to Justin, who had struggled to his knees. Grabbing him by his shirt, he effortlessly lifted him to dangle by the street. Don't think I forgot your part in all this, 
when I'm finished with Askan, I'm coming for you. I will make you suffer like never before. Tell the rest of them, I'm coming for them too. You all betrayed me. I don't care where you run, I will find you. His anger growing, Connell spun around, Justin rolling like a rag doll and flung his former associate against the stone wall. Justin flopped to the ground, his arm broken. Leaving Justin groaning in pain, Connell twisted his head to glare at the passersby who quickly gave urgency to the steps. My, my, Oscon sneered with false bravura. Such violence. Pity I didn't know about this. Not, uh, pity I didn't know this about you before. I can use a man like you. We need to go, Briak intervened. Leading the way, Briak led them through streets and back alleys that moved single file, with Oscon behind Briak, Torgoth behind Oscon, the dagger's blade firm against the man's side, and Connell bringing up the rear. At one nondescript door, halfway down a deserted alley, Briak stopped and knocked in a rhythmic pattern of a three, two, three, one knocks. A peephole door slid open to the side. Briak leaned forward and whispered, Dragon home. The peephole door closed and the heavy oak door silently swung open, revealing a hulking brute of a man whose intimidating scowl reminded those attempting to force their way in that he would personally inflict mayhem on them. Is he here? Briak asked. The man nodded and lifted a thick arm to point down the darkened corridor. By the time Connell entered, Brick was halfway down the hall. The door closed behind him and he squinted to see light coming from beneath the door at the end of the hall. Light spilled out into the corridor when Brick opened the door, then stood to the side of the other stepped into a large room, sparsely furnished, whose sole occupant stood close to the fireplace, reading a book and a tall bookstand. Wall scances, surrounding the room provided more than ample light. Connell startled for the tall individual behind the book was an elf. Greetings, Galadier, Drag said with a respectful nod. Greetings, my friend, the elf replied with a warm smile, closing the book. <clears throat> Galadier stood a little taller <clears throat> than Connell. He wore a sleeveless tunic of supple forest brown leather and woolen breeches the color of faded crimson, tucked into stout leather boots that ended just below his knees. His long blonde hair was held back by a braided leather cord <clears throat> wrapped around his forehead, revealing the telltale pointed ears. This one, Briak indicated Oscon, needs guarding. No sooner had he finished that the door opened and the hulking man at the outside door stepped in. Take that one, Galadir said, pointing a slender finger at Oscon, and see that he is well contained. What's going on? Oscon demanded. You can't treat me like this. The hulking man growled and went to reach for Oscon. Easy, Brunet, Galadier soothed before addressing Oscon. You have a choice on how you can leave this room. Choose wisely. Oscon's eyes twitched from Brunet to Connell to the elf, knowing he only had one choice. Snarling, he jerked around to follow Brunet. Once the door closed behind them, Galadier shifted his devoted attention to Connell. Is this he? Yes. Briak answered. What's going on in the city? Who's guarding the gates? There's been some unrest, Galadir explained. The men you saw were new recruits. They had not had time to be fully kitted. Unrest? Rumors mostly. They must make Pharaoh exercise caution. Accepting the answer, he nodded for Torgret to show Galadir the dagger. There is also this. Well met, friend Torgret. The elf greeted him, accepting the dagger. The reasons for your escape have been made known to me. And who are you? The dwarf boldly asked. Galadier raised a finger, telling him to wait while he studied the dagger. This is the king's dagger. Holding the dagger in both hands, he bent his head and closed his eyes, bringing the flat of the blade up and pressing it against his forehead. A thick silence filled the room as they waited and watched Galadier's serene face morph to a heavy frown. Opening his eyes, he inhaled a slow breath. The dagger's name is Bloodthirst. He tilted his head to stare at Torgrith, his cobalt uh, blue eyes boring into him. Where did you find this? Oscon had it, Torgrith replied. It's Elven imbued, isn't it? Yes, Galadir nodded, shifting his gave to Briak. I will question the other in a bit. We must discern how he came by this. What's so special about it, Connell asked. It is a king's dagger. Galadier explained. Everyone keeps saying that, Connell interrupted. 
A king's dagger, Galadir patiently continued, can only be forged by a dwarf, and not just any dwarf. He tilted his head to narrow his gaze at Torgrith. The dwarf must be from the lineage of the Iron Hand, like you. Once the dagger is crafted, it is carried to the Elven Kingdom in Alluvial, where mages imbue the blade with a special gift. Some are warning blades that glow or hum when danger is near. Others are reactive blades that give additional strength to the man who wields it so that if attacked, he can defeat his enemies. Still others, like Bloodthirst here, were designed to wreak vengeance, thirsting for blood and death until the threat is no more. It is a blade to be fearful of because in the wrong hands, he can do much damage. Colonel Brow furrowed. Then why didn't Oscon have this power? Galadir looked at him as though the answer was obvious. He is not a king. So only a king can use the dagger? A king or one descended from a king? Connell blinked to the revelation. revelation. May I see it? Ignoring Briac's look of fear, Galadir handed him the dagger. Grasping the handle, Connell felt a sudden surge of rage fill his entire body as the clarity of the room clouded so that only the dagger had any visible form. The blade in his hands felt like an extension of his own body. His head snapped up and a cloud vanished in his angry eyes, locked on each one of the room, instantaneously measuring each individual threat toward him. Then just as suddenly, the seething storm disappeared and he stood in the middle of the room, his heart pounding as though coming off the battlefield. What did you see? Galadier held out his hand for the dagger. I didn't see anything, he replied, catching his breath, reluctant to surrender the blade. What did you feel? Galadier fixed him with a firm stare, his hand still out. With a disappointed sigh, he handed the dagger, dagger back to him. I felt anger, totally consuming anger, like I wanted to kill everything around me. But then when I looked at each of you, the anger went away. That's because we are not a threat to you. Galadier slid a sanctified glance at Birak. Briak. I have a question, Torbeth announced, looking straight at Galadir. Who are you? I am Galadir. Yeah, we know. Where are you from? Why are you here? Torgoth folded his arms across his chest. Galadir paused as if deliberating how much to tell. I am from Oliveville. Long way from home, Torbeth observed. Yes, that is true. Studying the dwarf, then Connell, he placed the dagger on the top of the book he was reading and cupped his hands behind his back. I'm a friend of Prince Kirith. Who's he? Let him finish, Briak chided. Sorry, Torbeth lamely replied. Prince Kirith, Galadir continued, is King Phileo's son, one of the few who recognizes and understands the threat the kingdom faces. Torgoth was about to say, so you ran away? When reminded of his own flight from Havard and King Rorkin. Instead he said, so you came here to look for help? Yes, which leads me to ask how that fellow came by this dagger. Its original home was in Havengard. How did it end up here? I think it's time we find out. He's not going to say much, Torbeth warned. We tried already. Galadir smiled. I'm sure you have. Let's try again. He held up the dagger and cast a sly glance at Connell. Perhaps I should give this to you when we interrogate him. All righty. First two chapters of book two in the books. So uh, if you're not subscribed, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Um, we do these videos every week and you'll get to follow along as we do the author reading of um, the entire book, two chapters at a time. So um, always good to have you, uh, PD Mac. So uh, with that said, we'll call it a video. See you next week.